Section one of Theory of Colours. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Theory of Colours by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. Translated by Charles Eastlake. The Translator's Preface english writers who have spoken of goethe's doctrine of colours have generally confined their remarks to those parts of the work in which he has undertaken to account for the colours of the prismatic spectrum and of refraction altogether on principles different from the received theories of newton the less questionable merits of the treatise consisting of a well-arranged mass of observations and experiments many of which are important and interesting have thus been in a great measure overlooked the translator aware of the opposition which the theoretical views alluded to have met with intended at first to make a selection of such of the experiments as seem more directly applicable to the theory and practice of painting finding however that the alterations this would have involved would have been incompatible with a clear and connected view of the author's statements he preferred giving the theory itself entire reflecting at the same time that some scientific readers may be curious to hear the author speak for himself even on the points at issue in reviewing the history and progress of his opinions and researches goethe tells us that he first submitted his views to the public in two short essays entitled contributions to optics among the circumstances which he supposes were unfavourable to him on that occasion he mentions the choice of his title observing that by a reference to optics he must have appeared to make pretensions to a knowledge of mathematics a science with which he admits he was very imperfectly acquainted another cause to which he attributes the severe treatment he experienced was his having ventured so openly to question the truth of the established theory but this last provocation could not be owing to mere inadvertence on his part indeed the larger work in which he alludes to these circumstances is still more remarkable for the violence of his objections to the newtonian doctrine there can be no doubt however that much of the opposition goethe met with was to be attributed to the manner as well as to the substance of his statements had he contented himself with merely detailing his experiments and showing their application to the laws of chromatic harmony leaving it to others to reconcile them as they could with the pre-established system or even to doubt in consequence the truth of some of the newtonian conclusions he would have enjoyed the credit he deserved for the accuracy and the utility of his investigations as it was the uncompromising expression of his convictions only exposed him to the resentment or silent neglect of a great portion of the scientific world so that for a time he could not even obtain a fair hearing for the less objectionable or rather highly valuable communications contained in his book a specimen of his manner of alluding to the newtonian theory will be seen in the preface it was quite natural that this spirit should call forth a somewhat vindictive feeling and with it not a little uncandid as well as unsparing criticism the doctrine of colours met with this reception in germany long before it was noticed in england where a milder and fairer treatment could hardly be expected especially at a time when owing perhaps to the limited intercourse with the continent german literature was far less popular than it is at present this last fact it is true can be of little importance in the present instance for although the change of opinion with regard to the genius of an enlightened nation must be acknowledged to be beneficial it is to be hoped there is no fashion in science and the translator begs to state once for all that in advocating the neglected merits of the doctrine of colours he is far from undertaking to defend its imputed errors sufficient time has however now elapsed since the publication of this work in eighteen ten to allow a calmer and more candid examination of its claims 
in this more pleasing task germany has again for some time led the way and many scientific investigators have followed up the hints and observations of goethe with a due acknowledgment of the acuteness of his views it may require more magnanimity in english scientific readers to do justice to the merits of one who was so open and in many respects it is believed so mistaken an opponent of newton but it must be admitted that the statements of goethe contain more useful principles in all that relates to harmony of colour than any that have been derived from the established doctrine it is no derogation of the more important truths of the newtonian theory to say that the views it contains seldom appear in a form calculated for direct application to the arts the principle of contrast so universally exhibited in nature so apparent in the action and reaction of the eye itself is scarcely hinted at the equal pretensions of seven colours as such and the fanciful analogies which their assumed proportions could suggest have rarely found favour with the votaries of taste indeed they have long been abandoned even by scientific authorities and here the translator stops he is quite aware that the defects which make the newtonian theory so little available for ascetic application are far from invalidating its more important conclusions in the opinion of most scientific men in carefully abstaining therefore from any comparison between the two theories in these latter respects he may still be permitted to advocate the clearness and fullness of goethe's experiments the german philosopher reduces the colours to their origin and simplest elements he sees and constantly bears in mind and sometimes ably elucidates the phenomena of contrast and gradation two principles which may be said to make up the artist's world and to constitute the chief elements of beauty these hints occur mostly in what may be called the scientific part of the work on the other hand in the portion expressly devoted to the ascetic application of the doctrine the author seems to have made but an inadequate use of his own principles in that part of the chapter on chemical colours which relates to the colours of plants and animals the same genius and originality which are displayed in the essays on morphology and which have secured to goethe undisputed rank among the investigators of nature are frequently apparent but one of the most interesting features of goethe's theory although it cannot be a recommendation in a scientific point of view is that it contains undoubtedly with very great improvements the general doctrine of the ancients and of the italians at the revival of letters the translator has endeavoured in some notes to point out the connection between the theory and the practice of the italian painters the doctrine of colours as first published in eighteen ten consists of two volumes in octavo and sixteen plates with descriptions in quarto it is divided into three parts a didactic a controversial and an historical part the present translation is confined to the first of these with such extracts from the other two as seemed necessary in fairness to the author to explain some of his statements the polemical and historical parts are frequently alluded to in the preface and elsewhere in the present work but it has not been thought advisable to omit these allusions no alterations whatever seem to have been made by goethe in the didactic portion in later editions but he subsequently wrote an additional chapter on entopic colours expressing his wish that it might be inserted in the theory itself at a particular place which he points out the form of this additional essay is however very different from that of the rest of the work and the translator has therefore merely given some extracts from it in the appendix the polemical portion has been more than once omitted in later editions in the first two parts the author's statements are arranged numerically in the style of bacon's natural history this we are told was for the convenience of reference but many passages are thus separately numbered which hardly seem to have required it the same arrangement is however strictly followed in the translation to facilitate a comparison with the original where it may be desired 
and here the translator observes that although he has sometimes permitted himself to make slight alterations in order to avoid unnecessary repetition or to make the author's meaning clearer he feels that an apology may rather be expected from him for having omitted so little he was scrupulous on this point having once determined to translate the whole treatise partly as before stated from a wish to deal fairly with a controversial writer and partly because many passages not directly bearing on the scientific views are still characteristic of goethe the observations which the translator has ventured to add are inserted in the appendix these observations are chiefly confined to such of the author's opinions and conclusions as have direct reference to the arts they seldom interfere with the scientific propositions even where these have been considered most vulnerable preface to the first edition of eighteen ten it may naturally be asked whether in proposing to treat of colours light itself should not first engage our attention to this we briefly and frankly answer that since so much has already been said on the subject of light it can hardly be desirable to multiply repetitions by again going over the same ground indeed strictly speaking it is useless to attempt to express the nature of a thing abstractedly effects we can perceive and a complete history of those effects would in fact sufficiently define the nature of the thing itself we should try in vain to describe a man's character but let his acts be collected and an idea of the character will be presented to us the colours are acts of light its active and passive modifications thus considered we may expect from them some explanation respecting light itself colours and light it is true stand in the most intimate relation to each other but we should think of both as belonging to nature as a whole for it is nature as a whole which manifests itself by their means in an especial manner to the sense of sight the completeness of nature displays itself to another sense in a similar way let the eye be closed let the sense of hearing be excited and from the lightest breath to the wildest din from the simplest sound to the highest harmony from the most vehement and impassioned cry to the gentlest word of reason still it is nature that speaks and manifests her presence her power her pervading life and the vastness of her relations so that a blind man to whom the infinite visible is denied can still comprehend an infinite vitality by means of another organ and thus as we descend the scale of being nature speaks to other senses to known misunderstood and unknown senses so speaks she with herself and to us in a thousand modes to the attentive observer she is nowhere dead nor silent she has even a secret agent in inflexible matter in a metal the smallest portions of which tell us what is passing in the entire mass however manifold complicated and unintelligible this language may often seem to us yet its elements remain ever the same with light poise and counterpoise nature oscillates within her prescribed limits yet thus arise all the varieties and conditions of the phenomena which are presented to us in space and time infinitely various are the means by which we become acquainted with these general movements and tendencies now as a simple repulsion and attraction now as an unsparkling and vanishing light as undulation in the air as commotion in matter as oxidation and deoxidation but always uniting or separating the great purpose is found to be to excite and promote existence in some form or other the observers of nature finding however that this poise and counterpoise are respectively unequal in effect have endeavoured to represent such a relation in terms they have everywhere remarked and spoken of a greater and lesser principle an action and resistance a doing and suffering an advancing and retiring a violent and moderating power and thus a symbolical language has arisen which from its close analogy may be employed as equivalent to a direct and appropriate terminology 
to apply these designations this language of nature to the subject we have undertaken to enrich and amplify this language by means of the theory of colours and the variety of their phenomena and thus facilitate the communication of higher theoretical views was the principal aim of the present treatise the work itself is divided into three parts the first contains the outline of a theory of colours in this the innumerable cases which present themselves to the observer are collected under certain leading phenomena according to an arrangement which will be explained in the introduction and here it may be remarked that although we have adhered throughout to experiment and thoroughly considered it as our basis yet the theoretical views which led to the arrangement alluded to could not but be stated it is sometimes unreasonably required by persons who do not even themselves attend to such a condition that experimental information should be submitted without any connecting theory to the reader or scholar who is himself to form his conclusions as he may list surely the mere inspection of a subject can profit us but little every act of seeing leads to consideration consideration to reflection reflection to combination and thus it may be said that in every attentive look on nature we already theorize but in order to guard against the possible abuse of this abstract view in order that the practical deductions we look to should be really useful we should theorize without forgetting that we are doing so we should theorize with mental self-possession and to use a bold word with irony in the second part we examine the newtonian theory a theory which by its ascendancy and consideration has hitherto impeded a free inquiry into the phenomena of colours we combat that hypothesis for although it is no longer found available it still retains a traditional authority in the world its real relations to its subject will require to be plainly pointed out the old errors must be cleared away if the theory of colours is not still to remain in the rear of so many other better investigated departments of natural science since however this second part of our work may appear somewhat dry as regards its matter and perhaps too vehement and excited in its manner we may here be permitted to introduce a sort of allegory in a lighter style as a prelude to that graver portion and as some excuse for the earnestness alluded to we compare the newtonian theory of colours to an old castle which was at first constructed by its architect with youthful precipitation it was however gradually enlarged and equipped by him according to the exigencies of time and circumstances and moreover was still further fortified and secured in consequence of feuds and hostile demonstrations the same system was pursued by his successors and heirs their increased wants within the harassing vigilance of their opponents without and various accidents compelled them in some places to build near in others in connection with, with the fabric and thus to extend the original plan it became necessary to connect all these incongruous parts and additions by the strangest galleries halls and passages all damages whether inflicted by the hand of the enemy or the power of time were quickly made good as occasion required they deepened the moats raised the walls and took care there should be no lack of towers battlements and embrasures this care and these exertions gave rise to a prejudice in favour of the great importance of the fortress and still upheld that prejudice although the arts of building and fortification were by this time very much advanced and people had learned to construct much better dwellings and defences in other cases but the old castle was chiefly held in honour because it had never been taken because it had repulsed so many assaults had baffled so many hostile operations and had always preserved its virgin renown this renown this influence lasts even now it occurs to no one that the old castle is become uninhabitable its great duration its costly construction are still constantly spoken of pilgrims wend their way to it hasty sketches of it are shown in all schools and it is thus recommended to the reverence of susceptible youth 
meanwhile the building itself is already abandoned its only inmates are a few invalids who in simple seriousness imagine that they are prepared for war thus there is no reason here respecting a tedious siege or a doubtful war so far from it we find this eighth wonder of the world already nodding to its fall as a deserted piece of antiquity and begin at once without further ceremony to dismantle it from gable and roof downwards that the sun may at last shine into the old nest of rats and owls and exhibit to the eye of the wandering traveller that labyrinthine incongruous style of building with its scanty makeshift contrivances the result of accident and emergency its intentional artifice and clumsy repairs such an inspection will however only be possible when wall after wall arch after arch is demolished the rubbish being at once cleared away as well as it can be to effect this and to level the site where it is possible to do so to arrange the materials thus acquired so that they can be hereafter again employed for a new building is the arduous duty we have undertaken in this second part should we succeed by a cheerful application of all possible ability and dexterity in raising this bastille and in gaining a free space it is thus by no means intended at once to cover the site again and to encumber it with a new structure we propose rather to make use of this area for the purpose of passing in review a pleasing and varied series of illustrative figures the third part is thus devoted to the historical account of early inquirers and investigators as we before expressed the opinion that the history of an individual displays his character so it may here be well affirmed that the history of science is science itself we cannot clearly be aware of what we possess till we have the means of knowing what others possess before us we cannot really and honestly rejoice in the advantages of our own time if we know not how to appreciate the advantages of former periods but it was impossible to write or even to prepare the way for a history of the theory of colours while the newtonian theory existed for no aristocratic presumption has ever looked down on those who were not of its order with such intolerable arrogance as that betrayed by the newtonian school of deciding on all that had been done in earlier times and all that was done around it with disgust and indignation we find priestley in the history of optics like many before and after him dating the success of all researches into the world of colours from the epoch of a decomposed ray of light or what pretended to be so looking down with a supercilious air on the ancient and less modern inquirers who after all had proceeded quietly in the right road and who have transmitted to us observations and thoughts in detail which we can neither arrange better nor conceive more justly we have a right to expect from one who proposes to give the history of any science that he informs us how the phenomena of which he treats were gradually known and what was imagined conjectured assumed or thought respecting them to state all this in due connection is by no means an easy task need we say that to write a history at all is always a hazardous affair with the most honest intention there is always a danger of being dishonest for in such an undertaking a writer tacitly announces at the outset that he means to place some things in light others in shade the author has nevertheless long derived pleasure from the prosecution of his task but it is the intention only that presents itself to the mind as a whole while the execution is generally accomplished portion by portion he is compelled to admit that instead of a history he furnishes only materials for one these materials consist in translations extracts original and borrowed comments hints and notes a collection in short which if not answering all that is required has at least the merit of having been made with earnestness and interest lastly such materials not altogether untouched it is true but still not exhausted may be more satisfactory to the reflecting reader in the state in which they are as he can easily combine them according to his own judgment 
this third part containing the history of the science does not however thus conclude the subject a fourth supplementary portion is added this contains a recapitulation or revision with a view to which chiefly the paragraphs are headed numerically in the execution of a work of this kind some things may be forgotten some are of necessity omitted so as not to distract the attention some can only be arrived at as corollaries and others may require to be exemplified and verified on all these accounts postscripts additions and corrections are indispensable this part contains besides some detached essays for example that on the atmospheric colours for as these are introduced in the theory itself without any classification they are here presented to the mind's eye at one view again if this essay invites the reader to consult nature herself another is intended to recommend the artificial aids of science by circumstantially describing the apparatus which will in future be necessary to assist researches into the theory of colours in conclusion it only remains to speak of the plates which are added at the end of the work and here we confess we are reminded of that incompleteness and imperfection which the present undertaking has in common with all others of its class for as a good play can be in fact only half transmitted to writing a great part of its effect depending on the scene the personal qualities of the actor the powers of his voice the peculiarities of his gestures and even the spirit and favourable humour of the spectators so it is in a still greater degree with a book which treats of the appearances of nature to be enjoyed to be turned to account nature herself must be present to the reader either really or by the help of a lively imagination indeed the author should in such cases communicate his observations orally exhibiting the phenomena he describes as a text in the first instance partly as they appear to us unsought partly as they may be presented by contrivance to serve in particular illustration explanation and description could not then fail to produce a lively impression the plates which generally accompany works like the present are thus a most inadequate substitute for all this a physical phenomenon exhibiting its effect on all sides is not to be arrested in lines nor denoted by a section no one ever dreams of explaining chemical experiments with figures yet it is customary in physical researches nearly allied to these because the object is thus found to be in some degree answered in many cases however such diagrams represent mere notions they are symbolic resources hieroglyphic modes of communication which by degrees assume the place of the phenomena and of nature herself and thus rather hinder than promote true knowledge in the present instance we could not dispense with plates but we have endeavoured so to construct them that they may be confidently referred to for the explanation of the didactic and polemical portions some of these may even be considered as forming part of the apparatus before mentioned we now therefore refer the reader to the work itself first only repeating a request which many an author has already made in vain and which the modern german reader especially so seldom grants si quid novisti rectius istis candidus imperti si non his uteri mecum End of section one. Section two of Theory of Colors. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nathan Rosequist of the Art Monastery Project. www.artmonastery.org. Theory of Colors by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, translated by Charles Eastlake. Introduction The desire of knowledge is first stimulated in us when remarkable phenomena attract our attention. In order that this attention be continued, it is necessary that we should feel some interest in exercising it, and thus by degrees we become better acquainted with the object of our curiosity. 
During this process of observation, we remark at first only a vast variety which presses indiscriminately on our view. We are forced to separate, to distinguish, and again to combine, by which means at last a certain order arises which admits of being surveyed with more or less satisfaction. To accomplish this only in a certain degree, in any department, requires an unremitting and close application, and we find for this reason that men prefer substituting a general theoretical view, or some system of explanation, for the facts themselves, instead of taking the trouble to make themselves first acquainted with cases in detail and then constructing a whole. The attempt to describe and class the phenomena of colors has been only twice made, first by Theophrastus, and in modern times by Boyle. The pretensions of the present essay to the third place will hardly be disputed. Our historical survey enters into further details. Here we merely observe that in the last century such a classification was not to be thought of, because Newton had based his hypothesis on a phenomenon exhibited in a complicated and secondary state and to this the other cases that forced themselves on the attention were contrived to be referred, when they could not be passed over in silence, just as an astronomer would do if, from whim, he were to place the moon in the center of our system, he would be compelled to make the earth, sun, and planets revolve round the lesser body, and be forced to disguise and gloss over the error of his first assumption by ingenious calculations and plausible statements. In our prefatory observations we assumed the reader to be acquainted with what was known respecting light. Here we assume the same with regard to the eye. We observed that all nature manifests itself by means of colors to the sense of sight. We now assert, extraordinary as it may in some degree appear, that the eye sees no form, inasmuch as light, shade, and color together constitute that which, to our vision, distinguishes object from object, and the parts of an object from each other. From these three, light, shade, and color, we construct the visible world, and thus at the same time make painting possible an art which has the power of producing on a flat surface a much more perfect visible world than the actual one can be. The eye may be said to owe its existence to light, which calls forth, as it were, a sense that is akin to itself. The eye, in short, is formed with reference to light to be fit for the action of light, the light it contains corresponding with the light without. We are here reminded of a significant adage in constant use with the ancient Ionian school, like is only known by like, and again of the words of an old mystic writer which may be thus rendered, if the eye were not sunny, how could we perceive light? If God's own strength lived not in us, how could we delight in divine things? This immediate affinity between light and the eye will be denied by none. To consider them as identical in substance is less easy to comprehend. It will be more intelligible to assert that a dormant light resides in the eye, and that it may be excited by the slightest cause from within or from without. In darkness we can, by an effort of imagination, call up the brightest images. In dreams objects appear to us as in broad daylight. Awake, the slightest external action of light is perceptible, and if the organ suffers an actual shock, light and colors spring forth. Here, however, those who are wont to proceed according to a certain method may perhaps observe that as yet we have not decidedly explained what color is. This question, like the definition of light and the eye, we would for the present evade, and would appeal to our inquiry itself, where we have circumstantially shown how color is produced. We have only, therefore, to repeat that color is a law of nature in relation with the sense of sight. We must assume, too, that every one has this sense, that every one knows the operation of nature on it, for to a blind man it would be impossible to speak of colors. That we may not, however, appear too anxious to shun such an explanation, we would restate what has been said as follows. Color is an elementary phenomenon in nature adapted to the sense of vision, a phenomenon which, like all others, exhibits itself by separation and contrast, by commixture and union, by augmentation and neutralization, by communication and dissolution, 
Under these general terms, its nature may be best comprehended. We do not press this mode of stating the subject on any one. Those who, like ourselves, find it convenient will readily adopt it, but we have no desire to enter the lists hereafter in its defense. From time immemorial it has been dangerous to treat of color, so much so that one of our predecessors ventured on a certain occasion to say, The ox becomes furious if a red cloth is shown to him, but the philosopher, who speaks of color only in a general way, begins to rave. Nevertheless, if we are to proceed to give some account of our work, to which we have appealed, we must begin by explaining how we have classed the different conditions under which color is produced. We found three modes in which it appears, three classes of colors, or rather three exhibitions of them all. The distinctions of these classes are easily expressed. Thus, in the first instance, we considered colors as far as they may be said to belong to the eye itself, and to depend on an action and reaction of the organ. Next, they attracted our attention as perceived in, or by means of, colorless mediums. And lastly, where we could consider them as belonging to particular substances. We have denominated the first physiological, the second physical, the third chemical colors. The first are fleeting and not to be arrested, the next are passing, but still for a while enduring. The last may be made permanent for any length of time. Having separated these classes and kept them as distinct as possible, with a view to a clear didactic exposition, we have been enabled at the same time to exhibit them in an unbroken series, to connect the fleeting with the somewhat more enduring, and these again with the permanent hues. And thus, after having carefully attended to a distinct classification in the first instance, to do away with it again, when a larger view was desirable. In a fourth division of our work, we have therefore treated generally what was previously detailed under various particular conditions, and have thus, in fact, given a sketch for a future theory of colors. We will here only anticipate our statements so far as to observe that light and darkness, brightness and obscurity, or if a more general expression is preferred, light and its absence, are necessary to the production of color. Next to the light, a color appears which we call yellow. Another appears next to the darkness, which we name blue. When these, in their purest state, are so mixed that they are exactly equal, they produce a third color called green. Each of the two first-named colors can, however, of itself produce a new tint by being condensed or darkened. They thus acquire a reddish appearance, which can be increased to so great a degree that the original blue or yellow is hardly to be recognized in it. But the intensest and purest red, especially in physical cases, is produced when the two extremes of the yellow-red and blue-red are united. This is the actual state of the appearance and generation of colors. But we can also assume an existing red in addition to the definite existing blue and yellow, and we can produce contrarywise by mixing what we directly produced by augmentation or deepening. With these three or six colors, which may be conveniently included in a circle, the elementary doctrine of colors is alone concerned. All other modifications, which may be extended to infinity, have reference more to the application, have reference to the technical operations of the painter and dyer, and the various purposes of artificial life. To point out another general quality, we may observe that colors throughout are to be considered as half-lights, as half-shadows, on which account, if they are so mixed as reciprocally to destroy their specific hues, a shadowy tint, a gray, is produced. In the fifth division of our inquiry, we had proposed to point out the relations in which we should wish our doctrine of colors to stand to other pursuits. Important as this part of our work is, it is perhaps on this very account not so successful as we could wish. Yet when we reflect that, strictly speaking, these relations cannot be described before they exist, we may console ourselves if we have in some degree failed in endeavoring for the first time to define them. For undoubtedly we should first wait to see how those whom we have endeavored to serve, to whom we have intended to make an agreeable and useful offering, how such persons, we say, will accept the result of our utmost exertion, whether they will adopt it, whether they will make use of it and follow it up, or whether they will repel, reject, and suffer it to remain unassisted and neglected. Meanwhile we venture to express what we believe and hope. From the philosopher we believe we merit thanks for having traced the phenomena of colors to their first sources, 
to the circumstances under which they simply appear and are, and beyond which no further explanation respecting them is possible. It will, besides, be gratifying to him that we have arranged the appearances described in a form that admits of being easily surveyed, even should he not altogether approve of the arrangement itself. The medical practitioner, especially him whose study it is to watch over the organ of sight, to preserve it, to assist its defects, and to cure its disorders, we reckon to make especially our friend. In the chapter on the physiological colors, in the appendix relating to those that are more strictly pathological, he will find himself quite in his own province. We are not without hopes of seeing the physiological phenomena, a hitherto neglected and, we may add, most important branch of the theory of colors, completely investigated through the exertions of those individuals who in our own times are treating this department with success. The investigator of nature should receive us cordially, since we enable him to exhibit the doctrine of colors in the series of other elementary phenomena, and at the same time enable him to make use of corresponding nomenclature, nay, almost the same words and designations as under the other rubrics. It is true we give him rather more trouble as a teacher, for the chapter of colors is not now to be dismissed as heretofore with a few paragraphs and experiments. Nor will the scholar submit to be so scantily entertained as he has hitherto been, without murmuring. On the other hand, an advantage will afterwards arise out of this, for if the Newtonian doctrine was easily learnt, insurmountable difficulties presented themselves in its application. Our theory is perhaps more difficult to comprehend, but once known, all is accomplished, for it carries its application along with it. The chemist who looks upon colors as indications by which he may detect the more secret properties of material things has hitherto found much inconvenience in the denomination and description of colors. Nay, some have been induced, after closer and nicer examination, to look upon color as an uncertain and fallacious criterion in chemical operations. Yet we hope, by means of our arrangement and the nomenclature before alluded to, to bring color again into credit and to awaken the conviction that a progressive, augmenting, mutable quality, a quality which admits of alteration even to inversion, is not fallacious, but rather calculated to bring to light the most delicate operations of nature. In looking a little further round us, we are not without fears that we may fail to satisfy another class of scientific men. By an extraordinary combination of circumstances, the theory of colors has been drawn into the province and before the tribunal of the mathematician, a tribunal to which it cannot be said to be amenable. This was owing to its affinity with the other laws of vision which the mathematician was legitimately called upon to treat. It was owing, again, to another circumstance. A great mathematician had investigated the theory of colors, and having been mistaken in his observations as an experimentalist, he employed the whole force of his talent to give consistency to this mistake. Were both these circumstances considered, all misunderstanding would presently be removed, and the mathematician would willingly cooperate with us, especially in the physical department of the theory. To the practical man, to the dyer, on the other hand, our labor must be altogether acceptable for it was precisely those who reflected on the facts resulting from the operations of dying who were the least satisfied with the old theory. They were the first who perceived the insufficiency of the Newtonian doctrine. The conclusions of men are very different according to the mode in which they approach a science or branch of knowledge, from which side, through which door they enter. The literally practical man, the manufacturer, whose attention is constantly and forcibly called to the facts which occur under his eye, who experiences benefit or detriment from the application of his convictions, to whom loss of time and money is not indifferent, who is desirous of advancing, who aims at equaling or surpassing what others have accomplished, such a person feels the unsoundness and erroneousness of a theory much sooner than a man of letters, in whose eyes words consecrated by authority are at last equivalent to solid coin than the mathematician whose formula always remains infallible even although the foundation on which it is constructed may not square with it again to carry on the figure before employed in entering this theory from the side of painting from the side of aesthetic coloring generally we shall be found to have accomplished a most thankworthy office for the artist in the sixth part we have endeavored to define the effects of color as addressed at once to the eye and mind with a view to making them more available for the purposes of art. 
although much in this portion and indeed throughout has been suffered to remain as a sketch it should be remembered that all theory can in strictness only point out leading principles under the guidance of which practice may proceed with vigor and be enabled to attain legitimate results end of introduction recording by nathan rosequist of the art monastery project www.artmonastery.org Section 3 of Theory of Colors. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dylan Campbell. Theory of Colors by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. Translated by Charles Eastlake. Section 3. Part 1. Physiological Colors. 1. We naturally place these colors first because they belong altogether or in a great degree to the subject, to the eye itself. They are the foundation of the whole doctrine and open to our view the chromatic harmony on which so much difference of opinion has existed. They have been hitherto looked upon as extrinsic and casual, as illusion and infirmity. Their appearances have been known from ancient date, but as they were too evanescent to be arrested, they were banished into the region of phantoms and under this idea have been very variously described. 2. Thus they are called color adventici by Boyle, imaginati fantastici by Rossetti, by Buffon, Color Accidentale, by Schurfer, Scheinfarben, Apparent Colors, Ocular Illusions and Deceptions of Sight by Many, by Hamburger, Pitia Fugitiva, by Darwin, Ocular Spectra. 3. We have called them physiological because they belong to the eye in a healthy state, because we consider them as the necessary conditions of vision, the lively alternating action of which, with reference to external objects and the principle within it, is thus plainly indicated. 4. To these we subjoin the pathological colors, which, like all deviations from a constant law, afford a more complete insight into the nature of the physiological colors. Effects of light and darkness on the eye. 5. The retina, after being acted upon by light or darkness, is found to be in two different states, which are entirely opposed to each other. 6. If we keep the eyes open in a totally dark place, a certain sense of privation is experienced. The organ is abandoned to itself. It retires into itself. That stimulating and grateful contact is wanting by means of which it is connected with the external world and becomes part of a whole. 7. If we look on a white, strongly illumined surface, the eye is dazzled, and for time is incapable of distinguishing objects moderately lighted. 8. The whole of the retina is acted on in each of these extreme states, and thus we can only experience one of these effects at a time. In the one case, 6, we found the organ in the utmost relaxation and susceptibility, in the other, 7, in an overstrained state, and scarcely susceptible at all. 9. If we pass suddenly from the one state to the other, even without supposing these to be the extremes, but only perhaps a change from bright to dusky, the difference is remarkable, and we find that the effects last for some time. 10. In passing from bright daylight to a dusky place, we distinguish nothing at first. By degrees, the eye recovers its susceptibility, strong eyes sooner than weak ones, the former in a minute, while the latter may require seven or eight minutes. 11. The fact that the eye is not susceptible to faint impressions of light, if we pass from light to comparative darkness, has led to curious mistakes in scientific observations. Thus, an observer, whose eyes required some time to recover their tone, was long under the impression that rotten wood did not emit light at noonday, even in a dark room. The fact was, he did not see the faint light because he was in the habit of passing from bright sunshine to the dark room, and only subsequently remained so long there that the eye had time to recover itself. The same may have happened to Dr. Wall, who, in the daytime, even in a dark room, could hardly perceive the electric light of amber. Our not seeing the stars by day, as well as the improved appearance of pictures seen through a double tube, is also to be attributed to the same cause. 12. If we pass from a totally dark place to one illumined by the sun, we are dazzled. In coming from a lesser degree of darkness to light that is not dazzling, we perceive all objects clearer and better. Hence, eyes that have been in a state of repose are in all cases better able to perceive moderately distinct appearances. Prisoners who have been long confined in darkness acquire so great a susceptibility of the retina that even in the dark, probably a darkness very slightly illumined, they can still distinguish objects. 13. In the act which we call seeing, the retina is at one and the same time in different and even opposite states. 
The greatest brightness, short of dazzling, acts near the greatest darkness. In this state, we at once perceive all the intermediate gradations of chiaroscuro and all the varieties of hues. 14. We will proceed in due order to consider and examine these elements of the visible world, as well as the relation in which the organ itself stands to them, and for this purpose we take the simplest objects. Footnote 1. The German distinction between subject and object is so generally understood and adopted that it is hardly necessary to explain that the subject is the individual, in this case the beholder, the object, all that is without him. End of section 3、section、four of Theory of Colors This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nathan Rosequist of the Art Monastery Project, www.artmonastery.org. Theory of Colors by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, translated by Charles East Lake. Part 1, Section 2 Effects of Black and White Objects on the Eye. 15. In the same manner as the retina generally is affected by brightness and darkness, so it is affected by single bright or dark objects. If light and dark produce different results on the whole retina, so black and white objects seen at the same time produce the same states together which light and dark occasioned in succession. 16. A dark object appears smaller than a bright one of the same size. Let a white disc be placed on a black ground, and a black disc on a white ground, both being exactly similar in size. Let them be seen together at some distance, and we shall pronounce the last to be about a fifth part smaller than the other. If the black circle be made larger by so much, they will appear equal. 17. Thus, Tycho de Brahe remarked that the moon in conjunction, the darker state, Appears about a fifth part smaller than when in opposition, the bright full state. The first crescent appears to belong to a larger disc than the remaining dark portion, which can sometimes be distinguished at the period of the new moon. Black dresses make people appear smaller than light ones. Lights seen behind an edge make an apparent notch in it. A ruler behind which the flame of a light just appears seems to us indented. The rising or setting sun appears to make a notch in the horizon. 18. Black, as the equivalent of darkness, leaves the organ in a state of repose. White, as the representative of light, excites it. We may perhaps conclude from the above experiment that the unexcited retina, if left to itself, is drawn together, and occupies a less space than in its active state. Produced by the excitement of light. Hence, Kepler says very beautifully, Certum est vel in retina causa pitture, vel in spiritibus causa impressionis, existere dilatationem lucidorum. It is certain that, whether as a retinal image or the impression it makes on our spirit, light has an enlarging quality. This from Paralipomenon in Vitellionum, page 220. Scherfer expresses a similar conjecture. Footnote by Goethe's scientific friend Thomas Johann Siebeck. Leonardo da Vinci observes that a light object relieved on a dark ground appears magnified. And again, objects seen at a distance appear out of proportion. This is because the light parts transmit their rays to the eye more powerfully than the dark. A woman's white headdress once appeared to me much wider than her shoulders, owing to their being dressed in black. It is now generally admitted that the excitation produced by light is propagated on the retina a little beyond the outline of the image. Professor Plateau of Ghent has devoted a very interesting special memoir to the description and explanation of phenomena of this nature. See his Memoir sur les radiations. Published in the eleventh volume of the Transactions of the Royal Academy of Sciences at Brussels. End of footnote. 
However this may be, both impressions derived from such objects remain in the organ itself and last for some time, even when the external cause is removed. In ordinary experience we scarcely notice this, for objects are seldom presented to us which are very strongly relieved from each other, and we avoid looking at those appearances that dazzle the sight. In glancing from one object to another, the succession of images appears to us distinct. We are not aware that some portion of the impression derived from the object first contemplated passes to that which is next looked at. 20. If in the morning, on waking, when the eye is very susceptible, we look intently at the bars of a window relieved against the dawning sky, and then shut our eyes or look towards a totally dark place, we shall see a dark cross on a light ground before us for some time. 21. Every image occupies a certain space on the retina, and of course a greater or less space in proportion as the object is seen near or at a distance. If we shut the eyes immediately after looking at the sun, we shall be surprised to find how small the image it leaves appears. 22. If, on the other hand, we turn the open eye towards the side of a room and consider the visionary image in relation to other objects, we shall always see it larger in proportion to the distance of the surface on which it is thrown. This is easily explained by the laws of perspective, according to which a small object near covers a great one at a distance. 23. The duration of these visionary impressions varies with the powers or structure of the eye in different individuals, just as the time necessary for the recovery of the tone of the retina varies in passing from brightness to darkness. It can be measured by minutes and seconds, indeed much more exactly than it could formerly have been, by causing a lighted linstock to revolve rapidly so as to appear a circle. Footnote by Thomas Johann Siebeck the duration of ocular spectra produced by strongly exciting the retina may be conveniently measured by minutes and seconds, but to ascertain the duration of more evanescent phenomena, recourse must be had to other means. The Chevalier d'Arcy, in Memoirs of the Academy of Science, 1765, endeavored to ascertain the duration of the impression produced by a glowing coal in the following manner. He attached it to the circumference of a wheel, the velocity of which was gradually increased until the apparent trace of the object formed a complete circle, and then measured the duration of the revolution, which was obviously that of the impression. To ascertain the duration of a revolution, it is sufficient merely to know the number of revolutions described in a given time. Recently, more refined experiments of the same kind have been made by Professors Plateau and Wheatstone. End footnote. 24 but the force with which an impinging light impresses the eye is especially worthy of attention. The image of the sun lasts longest. Other objects of various degrees of brightness leave the traces of their appearance on the eye for a proportionate time. 25. These images disappear by degrees and diminish at once in distinctness and in size. 26. They are reduced from the contour inwards, and the impression on some persons has been that in square images the angles become gradually blunted, till at last a diminished round image floats before the eye. 27. Such an image, when its impression is no more observable, can, immediately after, be again revived on the retina by opening and shutting the eye, thus alternately exciting and resting it. 28. Images may remain on the retina in morbid affections of the eye for fourteen, seventeen minutes, or even longer. This indicates extreme weakness of the organ, its inability to recover itself, while visions of persons or things which are the objects of love or aversion indicate the connection between sense and thought. 29. If, while the image of the window bars before mentioned lasts, we look upon a light gray surface, the cross will then appear light and the panes dark. In the first case, the image was like the original picture, so that the visionary impression also could continue unchanged, 
but in the present instance our attention is excited by a contrary effect being produced. Various examples have been given by observers of nature. 30. The scientific men who made observations in the Cordilleras saw a bright appearance round the shadows of their heads on some clouds. This example is a case in point, for while they fixed their eyes on the dark shadow, and at the same time moved from the spot, the compensatory light image appeared to float round the real dark one. If we look at a black disk on a light gray surface, we shall presently, by changing the direction of the eyes in the slightest degree, see a bright halo floating round the dark circle. A similar circumstance happened to myself. For while, as I sat in the open air, I was talking to a man who stood at a little distance from me, relieved on a gray sky, it appeared to me, as I slightly altered the direction of my eyes, after having for some time looked fixedly at him, that his head was encircled with a dazzling light. In the same way, probably, might be explained the circumstance that persons crossing dewy meadows at sunrise see a brightness round each other's heads. The brightness in this case may be also iridescent as the phenomena of refraction come into the account. Thus again it has been asserted that the shadows of a balloon thrown on clouds were bordered with bright and somewhat variegated circles. Beccaria made use of a paper kite in some experiments on electricity. Round his kite appeared a small shining cloud varying in size. The same brightness was even observed round part of the string. Sometimes it disappeared, and if the kite moved faster, the light appeared to float to and fro for a few moments on the place before occupied. This appearance, which could not be explained by those who observed it at the time, was the image which the eye retained of the kite relieved as a dark mass on a bright sky, that image being changed into a light mass on a comparatively dark background. In optical and especially in chromatic experiments, where the observer has to do with bright lights, whether colorless or colored, great care should be taken that the spectrum which the eye retains in consequence of a previous observation does not mix with the succeeding one, and thus affect the distinctness and purity of the impression. 31. These appearances have been explained as follows. That portion of the retina on which the dark cross was impressed is to be considered in a state of repose and susceptibility. On this portion, therefore, the moderately light surface acted in a more lively manner than on the rest of the retina, which had just been impressed with the light through the panes, and which, having thus been excited by a much stronger brightness, could only view the gray surface as a dark. 32. This mode of explanation appears sufficient for the cases in question, but, in the consideration of phenomena hereafter to be adduced, we are forced to trace the effects to higher sources. 33. The eye, after sleep, exhibits its vital elasticity more especially by its tendency to alternate its impressions, which in the simplest form change from dark to light, and from light to dark. The eye cannot for a moment remain in a particular state determined by the object it looks upon. On the contrary, it is forced to a sort of opposition, which, in contrasting extreme with extreme, intermediate degree with intermediate degree, at the same time combines these opposite impressions and thus ever tends to a whole, whether the impressions are successive or simultaneous and confined to one image. 34. Perhaps the peculiarly grateful sensation which we experience in looking at the skillfully treated chiaroscuro of colorless pictures and similar works of art arises chiefly from the simultaneous impression of a whole, which by the organ itself is sought, rather than arrived at, in succession and which, whatever may be the result, can never be arrested. End of Part 1, Section 2 Recording by Nathan Rosequist of the Art Monastery Project Artmonastery.org Section 5 of Theory of Colours This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Deborah Wade, Cambridge, United Kingdom. Theory of Colours by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. Translated by Charles Eastlake. Part 1, Section 3. Grey Surfaces and Objects. 35. 
A moderate light is essential to many chromatic experiments. This can be presently obtained by surfaces more or less grey, and thus we have at once to make ourselves acquainted with this simplest kind of middle tint, with regard to which it is hardly necessary to observe that in many cases a white surface in shadow or in a low light may be considered equivalent to a grey. 36. Since a grey surface is intermediate between brightness and darkness, it admits of our illustrating a phenomenon before described, 29, by an easy experiment. 37. Let a black object be held before a grey surface, and let the spectator, after looking steadfastly at it, keep his eyes unmoved while it is taken away. The space it occupied appears much lighter. Let a white object be held up in the same manner. On taking it away, the space it occupied will appear much darker than the rest of the surface. Let the spectator in both cases turn his eyes this way and that on the surface. The visionary images will move in like manner. 38. A grey object on a black ground appears much brighter than the same object on a white ground. If both comparisons are seen together, the spectator can hardly persuade himself that the two greys are identical. We believe this again to be a proof of the great excitability of the retina, and of the silent resistance which every vital principle is forced to exhibit when any definite or immutable state is presented to it. Thus, inspiration already presupposes expiration. Thus, every systole, its diastole. It is the universal formula of life which manifests itself in this, as in all other cases. When darkness is presented to the eye, it demands brightness, and vice versa. It shows its vital energy, its fitness to receive the impression of the object, precisely by spontaneously tending to an opposite state. End of part one, section three. Part 1, Section 4. Dazzling Colourless Objects 39. If we look at a dazzling, altogether colourless object, it makes a strong, lasting impression, and its after-vision is accompanied by an appearance of colour. 40. Let a room be made as dark as possible. Let there be a circular opening in the window shutter about three inches in diameter, which may be closed, or not, at pleasure. The sun being suffered to shine through this on a white surface, let the spectator from some little distance fix his eyes on the bright circle thus admitted. The hole being then closed, let him look towards the darkest part of the room. A circular image will now be seen to float before him. The middle of this circle will appear bright, colourless, or somewhat yellow, but the border will at the same moment appear red. After a time, this red increasing towards the centre covers the whole circle, and at last the bright central point. No sooner, however, is the whole circle red than the edge begins to be blue, and the blue gradually encroaches inwards on the red. When the whole is blue, the edge becomes dark and colourless, this darker edge again slowly encroaches on the blue till the whole circle appears colourless. The image then becomes gradually fainter, and at the same time diminishes in size. Here again we see how the retina recovers itself by a succession of vibrations after the powerful external impression it received. 25, 26. 41. By several repetitions similar in result, I found the comparative duration of these appearances in my own case to be as follows. I looked on the bright circle five seconds, and then, having closed the aperture, saw the coloured visionary circle floating before me. After thirteen seconds it was altogether red. Twenty-nine seconds next elapsed till the whole was blue, and forty-eight seconds till it appeared colourless. By shutting and opening the eye, 
I constantly revived the image so that it did not quite disappear till seven minutes had elapsed. Future observers may find these periods shorter or longer as their eyes may be stronger or weaker. 23. But it would be very remarkable if notwithstanding such variations, a corresponding proportion as to relative duration should be found to exist. 42. But this remarkable phenomenon no sooner excites our attention than we observe a new modification of it. If we receive the impression of the bright circle as before, and then look on a light grey surface in a moderately lighted room, an image again floats before us, but in this instance a dark one. By degrees it is encircled by a green border that gradually spreads inwards over the whole circle, as the red did in the former instance. As soon as this has taken place, a dingy yellow appears, and filling the space as the blue did before, is finally lost in a negative shade. 43. These two experiments may be combined by placing a black and white plane surface next to each other in a moderately lighted room, and then looking alternately on one and the other as long as the impression of the light circle lasts. The spectator will then perceive at first a red and green image alternately, and afterwards the other changes. After a little practice, the two opposite colours may be perceived at once by causing the floating image to fall on the junction of the two planes. This can be more conveniently done if the planes are at some distance, for the spectrum then appears larger. 44. I happen to be in a forge towards evening, at the moment when a glowing mass of iron was placed on the anvil. I had fixed my eyes steadfastly on it, and, turning around, I looked accidentally into an open coal shed. A large red image now floated before my eyes, and as I turned them from the dark opening to the light boards of which the shed was constructed, the image appeared half green, half red, according as it had a lighter or darker ground behind it. I did not at that time take notice of the subsequent changes of this appearance. 45. The after-vision occasioned by a total dazzling of the retina corresponds with that of a circumscribed bright object. The red colour seen by persons who are dazzled with snow belongs to this class of phenomena, as well as the singularly beautiful green colour which dark objects seem to wear after looking long on white paper in the sun. The details of such experiments may be investigated hereafter by those whose young eyes are capable of enduring such trials further for the sake of science. 46. With these examples we may also class the black letters which in the evening light appear red. Perhaps we might insert under the same category the story that drops of blood appeared on the table at which Henry the Fourth of France had seated himself with the Duc de Guise to play at dice. End of section five. Section six of Theory of Colours. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Deborah Wade, Cambridge, United Kingdom. Theory of Colours by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. Translated by Charles Eastlake. Part 1, Section 5. Coloured Objects. 47. We have hitherto seen the physiological colours displayed in the after-vision of colourless bright objects, and also in the after-vision of general colourless brightness. We shall now find analogous appearances if a given colour be presented to the eye. In considering this, all that has been hitherto detailed must be present to our recollection. 48. 
the impression of coloured objects remains in the eye like that of colourless ones but in this case the energy of the retina stimulated as it is to produce the opposite colour will be more apparent forty nine let a small piece of bright coloured paper or silk stuff be held before a moderately lighted white surface let the observer look steadfastly on the small coloured object and let it be taken away after a time while his eyes remain unmoved the spectrum of another colour will then be visible on the white plane the coloured paper may be also left in its place while the eye is directed to another part of the white plane the same spectrum will be visible there too for it arises from an image which now belongs to the eye fifty in order at once to see what colour will be evoked by this contrast the chromatic circle plate one figure three may be referred to the colours are here arranged in a general way according to the natural order and the arrangement will be found to be directly applicable in the present case for the colours diametrically opposed to each other in this diagram are those which reciprocally evoke each other in the eye thus yellow demands purple orange blue red green and vice versa thus again all intermediate graduations reciprocally evoke each other the simpler colour demanding the compound and vice versa note c fifty one the cases here under consideration occur oftener than we are aware in ordinary life indeed an attentive observer sees these appearances everywhere while on the other hand the uninstructed like our predecessors consider them as temporary visual defects sometimes even as symptoms of disorders in the eye thus exciting serious apprehensions a few remarkable instances may here be inserted fifty two i had entered an inn towards evening and as a well-favoured girl with a brilliantly fair complexion black hair and a scarlet bodice came into the room i looked attentively at her as she stood before me at some distance in half shadow as she presently afterwards turned away i saw on the white wall which was now before me a black face surrounded with a bright light while the dress of the perfectly distinct figure appeared of a beautiful sea-green fifty three among the materials for optical experiments there are portraits with colours and shadows exactly opposite to the appearance of nature the spectator after having looked at one of these for a time will see the visionary figure tolerably true to nature this is conformable to the same principles and consistent with experience for in the former instance a negress with a white headdress would have given me a white face surrounded with black in the case of the painted figures however which are commonly small the parts are not distinguishable by every one in the after image fifty four a phenomenon which has before excited attention among the observers of nature is to be attributed i am persuaded to the same cause it has been stated that certain flowers towards evening in summer coruscate become phosphorescent or emit a momentary light some persons have described their observation of this minutely i had often endeavoured to witness it myself and had even resorted to artificial contrivances to produce it on the nineteenth of june seventeen ninety nine late in the evening when the twilight was deepening into a clear night as i was walking up and down the garden with a friend we very distinctly observed a flame-like appearance near the oriental poppy the flowers of which are remarkable for their powerful red colour we approached the place and looked attentively at the flowers but could perceive nothing further till at last by passing and repassing repeatedly while we looked sideways on them we succeeded in renewing the appearance as often as we pleased it proved to be a physiological phenomenon such as others we have described and the apparent coruscation was nothing but the spectrum of the flower in the compensatory blue-green colour in looking directly at a flower 
the image is not produced but it appears immediately as the direction of the eye is altered again by looking sideways on the object a double image is seen for a moment for the spectrum then appears near and on the real object the twilight accounts for the eye being in a perfect state of repose and thus very susceptible and the colour of the poppy is sufficiently powerful in the summer twilight of the longest days to act with full effect and produce a compensatory image i have no doubt these appearances might be reduced to experiment and the same effect produced by pieces of coloured paper those who wish to take the most effectual means for observing the appearance in nature suppose in a garden should fix the eyes on the bright flowers selected for the purpose and immediately after look on the gravel path this will be seen studded with spots of the opposite colour this experiment is practicable on a cloudy day and even in the brightest sunshine for the sunlight by enhancing the brilliancy of the flower renders it fit to produce a compensatory colour sufficiently distinct to be perceptible even in a bright light thus peonies produce beautiful green marigolds vivid blue spectra fifty five as the opposite colour is produced by a constant law in experiments with coloured objects on portions of the retina so the same effect takes place when the whole retina is impressed with a single colour we may convince ourselves of this by means of coloured glasses if we look long through a blue pane of glass everything will afterwards appear in sunshine to the naked eye even if the sky is grey and the scene colourless in like manner in taking off green spectacles we see all objects in a red light every decided colour does a certain violence to the eye and forces the organ to opposition fifty six we have hitherto seen the opposite colours producing each other successively on the retina it now remains to show by experiment that the same effects can exist simultaneously if a coloured object impinges on one part of the retina the remaining portion at the same moment has a tendency to produce a compensatory colour to pursue a former experiment if we look on a yellow piece of paper placed on a white surface the remaining part of the organ has already a tendency to produce a purple hue on the colourless surface in this case the small portion of yellow is not powerful enough to produce this appearance distinctly but if a white paper is placed on a yellow wall we shall see the white tinged with a purple hue fifty seven although this experiment may be made with any colours yet red and green are particularly recommended for it because these colours seem powerfully to evoke each other numerous instances occur in daily experience if a green paper is seen through striped or flowered muslin the stripes or flowers will appear reddish a grey building seen through green palisades appears in like manner reddish a modification of this tint in the agitated sea is also a compensatory colour the light side of the waves appears green in its own colour and the shadowed side is tinged with the opposite hue the different direction of the waves with reference to the eye produces the same effect objects seen through an opening in the red or green curtain appear to wear the opposite hue these appearances will present themselves to the attentive observer on all occasions even to an unpleasant degree fifty eight having made ourselves acquainted with the simultaneous exhibition of these effects in direct cases we shall find that we can also observe them by indirect means if we place a piece of paper of a bright orange colour on the white surface we shall after looking intently at it scarcely perceive the compensatory colour on the rest of the surface but when we take the orange paper away and when the blue spectrum appears in its place immediately as this spectrum becomes fully apparent the rest of the surface will overspread as if by a flash with a reddish yellow light thus exhibiting to the spectator in a lively manner the productive energy of the organ 
in constant conformity with the same law. 59. As the compensatory colours easily appear where they do not exist in nature near and after the original opposite ones, so they are rendered more intense when they happen to mix with a similar real hue. In a court which was paved with grey limestone flags, between which grass had grown, the grass appeared of an extremely beautiful green when the evening clouds threw a scarcely perceptible reddish light on the pavement. In an opposite case, we find, in walking through meadows where we see scarcely anything but green, the stems of trees and the roads often gleam with a reddish hue. This tone is not uncommon in the works of landscape painters, especially those who practice in watercolours. They probably see it in nature, and thus unconsciously imitating it. Their colouring is criticised as unnatural. 60. These phenomena are of the greatest importance, since they direct our attention to the laws of vision, and are a necessary preparation for future observations on colours. They show that the eye especially demands completeness, and seeks to eke out the colorific circle in itself. The purple or violet colour suggested by yellow contains red and blue. Orange, which corresponds to blue, is composed of yellow and red. Green, uniting blue and yellow, demands red and so through all graduations of the most complicated combinations. That we are compelled in this case to assume three leading colours has already been remarked by other observers. 61. When in this completeness the elements of which it is composed are still appreciable by the eye, the result is justly called harmony. We shall subsequently endeavour to show how the theory of the harmony of colours may be deduced from these phenomena, and how, simply through these qualities, colours may be capable of being applied to aesthetic purposes. This will be shown when we have gone through the whole circle of our observations, returning to the point End from which we started. Six. Section 7 of Theory of Colours. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Deborah Wade, Cambridge, United Kingdom. Theory of Colours by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. Translated by Charles Eastlake. Part 1, Section 6 coloured shadows 62 before however we proceed further we have yet to observe some very remarkable cases of the vivacity with which the suggested colours appear in the neighbourhood of others we allude to coloured shadows to arrive at these we first turn our attention to shadows that are colourless or negative 63 a shadow cast by the sun in its full brightness on a white surface gives us no impression of colour it appears black, or, if a contrary light, here assumed to differ only in a degree, can act upon it, it is only weaker, half-lightened grey. 64. Two conditions are necessary for the existence of coloured shadows. First, that the principal light tinge the white surface with some hue. Secondly, that a contrary light illuminate to a certain extent the cast shadow. 65. Let a short lighted candle be placed at twilight on a sheet of white paper. Between it and the declining daylight, let a pencil be placed upright, so that its shadow thrown by the candle may be lighted, but not overcome by the weak daylight. The shadow will appear of the most beautiful blue. 66. That this shadow is blue is immediately evident, but we can only persuade ourselves by some attention that the white paper acts as a reddish yellow by means of which the complemental blue is excited in the eye. 67. In all coloured shadows, therefore, we must presuppose a colour excited or suggested by the hue of the surface on which the shadow is thrown. This may easily be found to be the case by attentive consideration. 
but we may convince ourselves at once by the following experiment. 68. Place two candles at night opposite each other on a white surface. Hold a thin rod between them upright so that two shadows be cast by it. Take a coloured glass and hold it before one of the lights so that the white paper appear coloured. At the same moment, the shadow cast by the coloured light and slightly illumined by the colourless one will exhibit the complemental hue. 69. An important consideration suggests itself here, to which we shall frequently have occasion to return. Colour itself is a degree of darkness. Skipov. Hence, Kircher is perfectly right in calling it lumen opacatum. As it is allied to shadow, so it combines readily with it. It appears to us readily in and by means of shadow, the moment a suggesting cause presents itself. We could not refrain from adverting at once to a fact which we propose to trace and develop hereafter. 70. Select the moment in twilight when the light of the sky is still powerful enough to cast a shadow, which cannot be entirely effaced by the light of a candle. The candle may be so placed that a double shadow shall be visible, one from the candle towards the daylight, and another from the daylight towards the candle. If the former is blue, the latter will appear orange-yellow. This orange-yellow is in fact, however, only the yellow-red light of the candle diffused over the whole paper, and which becomes visible in shadow. 71. This is best exemplified by the former experiment with two candles and coloured glasses. The surprising readiness with which shadow assumes a colour will again invite our attention in the further consideration of reflections and elsewhere. 72. Thus the phenomena of coloured shadows may be traced to their cause without difficulty. Henceforth, let any one who sees an instance of the kind observe only with what hue the light surface on which they are thrown is tinged. Nay, the colour of the shadow may be considered as a chromatoscope of the illuminated surface, for the spectator may always assume the colour of the light to be the opposite of that of the shadow, and by an attentive examination may ascertain this to be the fact in every instance. 73. These appearances have been a source of great perplexity to former observers, for, as they were remarked chiefly in the open air, where they commonly appear blue, they were attributed to a certain inherent blue or blue colouring quality in the air. The inquirer can, however, convince himself by the experiment with the candle in a room that no kind of blue light or reflection is necessary to produce the effect in question. The experiment may be made on a cloudy day with white curtains drawn before the light, and in a room where no trace of blue exists, and the blue shadow will be only so much the more beautiful. 74. De Saussure, in the description of his ascent of Mont Blanc, says, A second remark, which may not be uninteresting, relates to the colour of the shadows. These, notwithstanding the most attentive observation, we never found dark blue, although this had been frequently the case in the plain. On the contrary, in fifty-nine instances we saw them once yellowish, six times pale bluish, eighteen times colourless or black, and thirty-four times pale violet. Some natural philosophers suppose that these colours arise from accidental vapours diffused in the air, which communicate their own hues to the shadows. Not that the colours of the shadows are occasioned by the reflection of any given sky colour or interposition of any given air colour. The above observations seem to favour this opinion. The instances given by de Saussure may now be explained and classed with analogous examples without difficulty. At a great elevation the sky was generally free from vapours. The sun shone in full force on the snow, so that it appeared perfectly white to the eye. In this case they saw the shadows quite colourless. If the air was charged with a certain degree of vapour, in consequence of which the light snow would assume a yellowish tone, the shadows were violet coloured, and this effect, it appears, occurred oftenest. They saw also bluish shadows, but this happened less frequently, 
and that the blue and violet were pale was owing to the surrounding brightness by which the strength of the shadows was mitigated once only they saw the shadow yellowish in this case as we have already seen the shadow is cast by a colourless light and slightly illuminated by a coloured one seventy five in travelling over the hearts in winter i happened to descend from the brocken towards evening the wide slopes extended above and below me from the heath every insulated tree projecting rock and all masses of both were covered with snow or hoar frost the sun was sinking towards the odor ponds during the day owing to the yellowish hue of the snow shadows tending to violet had already been observable these might now be pronounced to be decidedly blue as the illumined parts exhibited a yellow deepening to orange but as the sun at last was about to set and its rays greatly mitigated by the thicker vapours began to diffuse a most beautiful red colour over the whole scene around me the shadow colour changed to a green in lightness to be compared to a sea green in beauty to the green of the emerald the appearance became more and more vivid one might have imagined oneself in a fairy world for every object had clothed itself in the two vivid and so beautifully harmonising colours till at last as the sun went down the magnificent spectacle was lost in a grey twilight and by degrees in a clear moon and starlight night seventy six one of the most beautiful instances of coloured shadows may be observed during the full moon the candle light and moonlight may be contrived to be exactly equal in force both shadows may be exhibited with equal strength and clearness so that both colours balance each other perfectly a white surface being placed opposite the full moon and the candle being placed a little on one side at a due distance an opaque body is held before the white plane a double shadow will then be seen that cast by the moon and illumined by the candle light will be a powerful red yellow and contrariwise that cast by the candle and illumined by the moon will appear of the most beautiful blue the shadow composed of the union of the two shadows where they cross each other is black the yellow shadow cannot perhaps be exhibited in a more striking manner the immediate vicinity of the blue and the interposing black shadow make the appearance more agreeable it will even be found if the eye dwells long on these colours that they mutually evoke and enhance each other the increasing red in the one still producing its contrast viz a kind of sea green seventy seven we are here led to remark that in this and in all cases a moment or two may perhaps be necessary to produce the complemental colour the retina must be first thoroughly impressed with the demanding hue before the responding one can be distinctly observable seventy eight when divers are under water and the sunlight shines into the diving bell everything is seen in a red light the cause of which will be explained hereafter while the shadows appear green the very same phenomenon which i observed on a high mountain is presented to others in the depths of the sea and thus nature throughout is in harmony with herself seventy nine some observations and experiments which equally illustrate what has been stated with regard to coloured objects and coloured shadows may be added here let a white paper blind be fastened inside the window on a winter evening in this blind let there be an opening through which the snow of some neighbouring roof can be seen towards dusk let a candle be brought into the room the snow seen through the opening will then appear perfectly blue because the paper is tinged with warm yellow by the candle light the snow seen through the aperture is here equivalent to a shadow illumined by a contrary light and may also represent a grey disc on a coloured surface eighty another very interesting experiment may conclude these examples if we take a piece of green glass of some thickness and hold it so that the window bars be reflected in it they will appear double owing to the thickness of the glass the image which is reflected from under the surface of the glass will be green the image which is reflected from the upper surface and which should be colourless will appear red the experiment 
may be very satisfactorily made by pouring water into a vessel, the inner surface of which can act as a mirror, for both reflections may first be seen colourless while the water is pure, and then by tinging it they will exhibit two opposite hues. End of section 7. Recording by Deborah Wade. Section 8 of Theory of Colors. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kieran Metz. Theory of Colors by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. Translated by Charles Eastlake. Section 8 Faint Lights, 81. Light, in its full force, appears purely white, and it gives this impression also in its highest degree of dazzling splendor. Light, which is not so powerful, can also, under various conditions, remain colorless. Several naturalists and mathematicians have endeavored to measure its degrees. Lambert, Bouguer, and Rumford. 82. Yet an appearance of color presently manifests itself in fainter lights, for in their relation to absolute light, they resemble the colored spectra of dazzling objects. 83. A light of any kind becomes weaker, either when its own force from whatever cause is diminished, or when the eye is so circumstanced or placed that it cannot be sufficiently impressed by the action of the light. Those appearances, which may be called objective, come under the head of physical colors. We will only advert here to the transition from white to red heat in glowing iron. We may also observe that the flames of lights at night appear redder in proportion to their distance from the eye. 84. Candlelight at night acts as yellow when seen near. We can perceive this by the effect it produces on other colors. At night, a pale yellow is hardly to be distinguished from white. Blue approaches to green and rose color to orange. 85. Candlelight at twilight acts powerfully as a yellow light. This is best proved by the purple-blue shadows which, under these circumstances, are evoked by the eye. 86. The retina may be so excited by a strong light that it cannot perceive fainter lights. If it perceive these, they appear colored. Hence, candlelight by day appears reddish, thus resembling, in its relation to fuller light, the spectrum of a dazzling object. Nay, if at night we look long and intently on the flame of a light, it appears to increase in redness. 87. There are faint lights which, notwithstanding their moderate luster, give an impression of a white, or, at the most, of a light yellow appearance on the retina, such as the moon in its full splendor. Rotten wood has even a kind of bluish light. All this will hereafter be the subject of further remarks. 88. If at night we place a light near a white or grayish wall, so that the surface be illumined from this central point to some extent, we find on observing the spreading light at some distance that the boundary of the illumined surface appears to be surrounded with a yellow circle, which on the outside tends to red-yellow. We thus observe that when light direct or reflected does not act in its full force, it gives an impression of yellow, of reddish, and lastly even of red. Here we find the transition to halos which we are accustomed to see in some mode or other round luminous points. Part 8. Subjective Halos 89. Halos may be divided into subjective and objective. The latter will be considered under the physical colors. The first only belong here. These are distinguished from the objective halos by the circumstance of their vanishing when the point of light which produces them on the retina is covered. 90. We have before noticed the impression of a luminous object on the retina and seen that it appears larger, but the effect is not at an end here. It is not confined to the impression of the image. An expansive action also takes place, spreading from the center. 91. 
that a nimbus of this kind is produced round the luminous image in the eye may be best seen in a dark room if we look towards a moderately large opening in the window shutter in this case the bright image is surrounded by a circular misty light i saw such a halo bounded by a yellow and yellow red circle on opening my eyes at dawn on an occasion when i passed several nights in a bed carriage ninety two halos appear most vivid when the eye is susceptible from having been in a state of repose a dark background also heightens their appearance both causes account for our seeing them so strong if a light is presented to the eyes on waking at night these conditions were combined when descartes after sleeping as he sat in a ship remarked such a vividly colored halo round the light ninety three a light must shine moderately not dazzle in order to produce the impression of a halo in the eye at all events the halos of dazzling lights cannot be observed we see a splendor of this kind round the image of the sun reflected from the surface of water ninety four a halo of this description attentively observed is found to be encircled towards its edge with a yellow border but even here the expanse of action before alluded to is not at an end but appears still to extend in varied circles ninety five several cases seem to indicate a circular action of the retina whether owing to the round form of the eye itself and its different parts or to some other cause ninety six if the eye is pressed only in a slight degree from the inner corner darker or lighter circles appear at night even without pressure we can sometimes perceive a succession of such circles emerging from or spreading over each other ninety seven we have already seen that a yellow border is apparent round the white space illumined by a light placed near it this may be a kind of objective halo ninety eight subjective halos may be considered as the result of a conflict between the light and a living surface from the conflict between the exciting principle and the excited an undulating motion arises which may be illustrated by a comparison with the circles on water the stone thrown in drives the water in all directions the effect attains a maximum it reacts and being opposed continues under the surface the effect goes on culminates again and thus the circles are repeated if we have ever remarked the concentric rings which appear in a glass of water on trying to produce a tone by rubbing the edge if we call to mind the intermitting pulsations in the reverberations of bells we shall approach a conception of what may take place on the retina when the image of a luminous object impinges on it not to mention that as a living and elastic structure it has already a circular principle in its organization ninety nine the bright circular space which appears round the shining object is yellow ending in red then follows a greenish circle which is terminated by a red border this appears to be the usual phenomenon where the luminous body is somewhat considerable in size these halos become greater the more distant we are from the luminous object one hundred halos may however appear extremely small and numerous when the impinging image is minute yet powerful in its effect the experiment is best made with a piece of gold leaf placed on the ground and illumined by the sun in these cases the halos appear in variegated rays the iridescent appearance produced in the eye when the sun pierces through the leaves of trees seems also to belong to the same class of phenomena End of section 8 Recording by Kieran Met